This is Harsh Rules. I'm Ben Harsh, and today we're going to continue to learn to play the Band of Brothers series, or as I like to affectionately call it, Bob, with a look at guns and vehicles. All the units in Bob are basically split into two groups. There are infantry and vehicles. Infantry are non-mechanized units that are composed of squads, SATW squads, weapon teams, and gun crews. Vehicles are composed of tanks and other forms of armor, transports, offboard artillery, and planes, which are more support units. I've developed this codification to make it easier to learn the game. First, let's take a look at guns. Guns are large caliber weapons and include anti-tank guns, artillery pieces, and anti-aircraft guns. Guns and vehicles cost three orders on the operations range, whereas normal infantry only cost one. The next key attribute is the gun's attack ratings. The number before the slash refers to the gun's offensive capabilities against vehicles. After the slash is the gun's offensive capabilities against other infantry. Another trait that guns share with vehicles is that they both have a facing direction. This shows the direction in which they're pointed. Guns have morale because they're manned by a crew of soldiers. Gun crews can become suppressed just like normal squads can. Guns also have a proficiency rating. This is the number you must roll under to be able to make a difficult shot. These two attributes can work together. So if your gun crew becomes suppressed and you need to make a difficult shot, you will need to make a morale check and a proficiency check before you can see if you've caused damage. The next attribute identifies the unit type. This is a 37 millimeter German gun. The casualty ratings for guns can be a bit complicated. If the gun is defending against a squad, a weapon team, or artillery, then you use the number before the slash. If the gun is defending against another gun, an SATW squad, a tank, or a plane, you'll use the number after the slash. Finally, for your information, I've added the unit grid to show you which number a particular unit uses in the casualty rating. Now let's take a look at the vehicle attributes. Vehicles, just like guns, cost three orders on the operations range. For attack ratings, the number before the slash is the vehicle's offensive capability against other vehicles. The number after the slash is the offensive capabilities against infantry. Vehicles have a facing direction that shows their angle on the field and determines their arc of fire. Movement shows the number of hexes the vehicle can move in a turn. The proficiency rating is the number you must roll beneath to perform a difficult task. This attribute shows the unit type, which is a Panzer III FL. Finally, vehicles have an armor rating. The number before the slash shows the front armor. The number after the slash shows the left, right, and rear armor. A final note on armor. If you see the armor rating has a black border, it means that the vehicle has rear vulnerability. This means the vehicle is susceptible to attack from the rear by infantry and weapons teams. And you will also need to use the special bracketed number to determine if the vehicle is eliminated in an attack. Finally, some vehicles have their guns replaced with flamethrowers. Flamethrowers only have a range of two hexes, and they only get full firepower in the first hex. In the second hex, they have half firepower rounded up. With flamethrowers, target terrain and armor is ignored except for the concealed marker. There's a plus two to vehicles with an open top, 
and when it's all over with, if the attack is less than the firepower on the roll, then it eliminates the target. Transports have a number of different rules which I'll cover off later in the video, but these are the basic attributes. This symbol signifies that the vehicle is open-topped and may transport one squad, a weapons team, or a gun. Transports also have a facing direction and an attribute that shows them how many hexes they can move. This attribute shows the unit type, which is an SPW 251-1. Finally, we have the transport's armor rating, and as you can see, these are built to transport units, not for combat, since it's a 1 and a 1 all the way around. Transports themselves do not have an order cost. Instead, the order for a particular transport mission is determined by the cargo it's carrying. So if a transport is towing a gun, it will cost three. If it is carrying passengers as a squad, it would be a cost of one. Just like squads, vehicles and guns can also take advantage of concealment. They may be covered with a conceal counter during setup as if they were a regular infantry unit. However, they can lose their concealment if they're in an enemy unit's line of sight, even if they're in concealment terrain, the unit moves, at least for tanks and transports, and the unit can't gain a conceal counter after the scenario starts. Now, let's talk about the facing position and potential movement of guns and vehicles. Guns are very heavy, and their crews can't move them easily. Really, all they can do is pivot them into a new firing position. So let's look at the facing of guns and how that works. Vehicles follow many of the same rules. The facing arrow of a gun is always aligned to one of these hex spines. When you position your gun with the arrow faced on the desired hex spine, then it determines your arc of fire. While guns are extremely heavy and difficult to actually move into a new hex, you can move them to a new location if you have a transport. Okay, one last rule for movement and pertaining to guns, and this has to do if you're taking an action of op fire or final op fire. Let's say that you're taking an action with your gun of op fire or final op fire. You pivot your gun and make a proficiency check to see if you can take a shot at the enemy target. However, you fail the proficiency check. Under these circumstances, when you fail a proficiency check, you must return the gun to its original position. The gun is then marked as used. With all these new units in play, let's cover off on the stacking rules of hexes. Now we learned from the first video that two squads can occupy one hex. Likewise, two weapons teams can occupy one hex. And obviously one squad and one weapon team can occupy one hex. Now when we get to gun crews, it gets a little more complicated. A squad can occupy a hex with a gun. A weapons team can occupy a hex with a gun. However, two guns cannot occupy one hex. There isn't enough room. Tanks and other vehicles follow the same rules as guns. Essentially, you can only have one gun or vehicle in a hex. Now guns don't typically move unless they have a transport. Let's say we have a vehicle that wants to pass through that hex to another hex on the other side. Can they do it? The answer is yes, they can do it, but they must follow this rule. Before they enter the hex, they must have enough movement points to move out of the hex by the end of the turn. If they don't have enough movement points, they cannot enter the hex.
In the rules of movement, the most complicated unit to learn is the transport, or half-track. Once you learn the rules for half-tracks, the rest of vehicle movement rules are very simple. A half-track can transport one squad, or one weapon team, or one gun. Some general rules about half-tracks. A loaded half-track counts as a vehicle for stacking purposes. Passengers and cargo do not account against the stacking limits. Transports count as a zero against the operations range. The cargo is tracked instead. Some additional notes. A passenger unit may not be marked as op fire if the transport uses a third or less of its movement points. And if a transport is towing a gun, it costs an additional half movement point per hex. First, let's look at how half tracks transport squads and weapon teams. When a squad mounts a half track, it costs half of the half track's movement points. They may do so only in a friendly hex, and this is a movement, so the squad must take a morale check. Once in transit, a squad and weapons team may conduct normal fire, and a weapons team may conduct assault fire. A route check is only required if the enemy is adjacent to the half-track. If you're an enemy unit firing at the half-track, there are special rules. If you're infantry, you may only target the passengers. If you're a gun, vehicle, or artillery, you may only target the transport. If your squad is utilizing an SATW, they may target either the passengers or the transport. Either way, if either the transport or the passenger is destroyed, then both units are destroyed. Dismounting costs half the transport's movement points. They may do so only in a friendly hex, and a morale check is required. Now if the half-track move that turn, then the unloaded units cannot move. But if the transport did not move that turn, then the unloaded units may move two hexes. Okay, now let's look at guns and half-tracks. When loading a gun, it's going to cost all of the half-track's movement points. You can do so only in a friendly hex, and a morale check is required for the gun crew. Once you're done, you mark both units as used. While in transit, you may not use the gun. It must be unloaded to be properly used. If the enemy is firing at the gun in transport, then if they're infantry, they can only target the gun. If they're a gun, a vehicle, or artillery, they must target the transport. And an SATW gets a choice of either the gun or the transport. In any case, if the transport or the gun is destroyed, then both units are destroyed. Unloading a gun costs all the half-track's movement points. It can be done only in a friendly hex, and a morale check is required. The gun can assume any facing, and you must mark both units as used. Transports, or half-tracks, are very unusual units and they only make brief appearances on the battlefield. Each appearance is marked in a specific scenario. Generally, the first time they will appear is during an initial deployment or a reinforcement. A key rule to keep in mind is that once a transport is empty, it is removed from the game board. So when a transport is slotted to appear on the board, it is always loaded. Once you unload the transport, it goes away. So, when you move a transport on the board, it's important to note what is exactly loaded on the transport. Then you will move that transport to the location you want to deploy your troops. The second instance where a transport may be used is if the rules stipulate that units may mount a half-track during this scenario. Essentially, what this allows you to do is to call in a half-track to transport your troops. To do this, you must locate a piece of open ground that will become your loading zone, and you must make sure there are no enemy units adjacent to this loading zone. 
you may then bring a half track onto the board and load your troops as normal. When you move the loaded transport to the desired location and you unload, then the transport is removed from the board again. Okay, let's run through this track and I'll show you how movement works with transports. First, we're going to look at half tracks that are transporting a squad. On this map, I've listed the available terrain and the movement costs. So for open terrain, it's a cost of one. If you stay on the road, it's a cost of half a movement point. If you're heading uphill and there's a road, it's two movement points. And if there's no road, it's four movement points. Moving downhill does not cost you any movement points. Now, loading the half track with troops costs half your movement points, so we're going to make the assumption here that we've done this in the last turn. The first seven hexes are all road, so we're going to advance our half track and take three and a half movement points. The next hex is uphill, so we take two movement points just from that. We cross the top of the hill, which is still on a road, for another movement point. The next hex is downhill, which doesn't cost us a movement point. And the next four hexes are flat road, so we take two additional movement points. This completes the half track's turn, and it's marked as used. So the next turn, we can use half our movement points to unload the half track. Okay, now it's going to get a little more complicated. We're actually going to load a gun and transport it over the hill. Because they're so heavy, loading and unloading a gun takes an entire turn. So we're going to make the assumption we've done that and we're ready to start the movement. Also, because guns are so heavy, it's going to add an extra half movement point to every move we make. So this time, the first seven hexes, which are open road on flat ground, will cost us one movement point each for a total of seven. The next hex is uphill, so this is going to cost us an additional two and a half movement points. Driving across the top of the hill costs us two movement points. The next hex is downhill, which normally doesn't cost us any movement points, but here with a loaded gun, it's going to cost us half a movement point. And we only have enough movement points now to move two additional hexes, and then our turn is finished. Now the next turn we'll be able to finish our journey and move those last two additional hexes, but also bear in mind that just unloading the gun takes an entire turn, so this has added two more turns onto our trip. So just bear that in mind when you're moving heavy equipment like guns around the battlefield. Bob has a number of morale checks, proficiency checks, and combat calculations to keep track of, so this is how I make sure I'm not forgetting anything. Simply remember the old saying, ready, aim, fire. Ready, do I need to make any morale checks? Aim, do I need to make any proficiency checks? And finally, fire, I need to run my battle equation. For ready, which is the morale check, just remember this only applies to infantry. So this would be guns, squads, and weapon teams. For aim, the proficiency check, remember this is the number in the lower right hand corner, usually with a little star symbol, that represents the number you need to roll underneath to be able to make a difficult shot or perform a complex task. Now let's see how proficiency checks work with guns and vehicles. 
Okay, I've placed the 37 millimeter German gun on the field, and I'm going to show you how this works with some target practice. This 37 millimeter German gun has a proficiency rating of 9, which means we need to roll at least a 9 or less to be proficient. If the target is at a range of less than 5 hexes, then no proficiency check is needed. At a range of 5 to 10 hexes, a proficiency check is required, but there's no modifier. At a range of 10 to 20 hexes, a proficiency check is required, and there's a plus 1 modifier to your dice results. So what this means now is you must roll at least an 8 or less to make the check. At a range of 20 to 30 hexes, there's a plus 2 modifier to your dice results. So now you must roll a 7 or less to make the check. And once you exceed 30 hexes, there's a plus 3 modifier to your dice results. So now you must roll at least a 6 or less to make the check. And when you get to fire, naturally it's time to shoot, which is, means it's time to run a battle equation. In Bob, there are three combat groups. There are squads and weapon teams, gun crews, and tanks and vehicles. I've created this combat versus chart to show you when these groups square off against each other, which checks and what types of battle equations you need to run. The new 2.1 rules have consolidated some of the battle equation to make it a little simpler, so let's run through that again. Vehicles and guns have their attack firepower ratings on the upper left-hand side of the unit. Squads and weapons teams have their firepower rating on the lower left-hand corner of the unit. Next, you must enter the target's terrain modifier. Unless your unit is attacking downhill, these modifiers will always be a negative, and they can range from negative 1 to even negative 6. Finally, you will enter the target situation modifier. Once you've entered all these, you will add them up to determine the modified firepower for the battle equation. Now, let's look at the various battle equations you can run. In an infantry versus infantry scenario, you're basically identifying three ranges. The suppression range, the full suppression reduction range, and the elimination range. First, you identify the modified firepower. This is the first number before the slash, plus the terrain modifier and situation modifier. Next, you're going to identify the suppression range. On the casualty rating, this is the number before the slash, in this case, a 3. So counting back, a roll of 4, 5, or 6 is suppression. Next, you're going to identify the elimination range. This is the number after the slash, which in this case is a 6. So you count back from the modified firepower 6. So this will take us off the range, and it would be a negative 1. This means that the number between suppression and elimination is your full suppression and reduction range. So in this case, it would be 1, 2, and 3. Now let's look at vehicles and guns versus other vehicles. First, you're going to identify the modified firepower. You do this by taking the number after the slash, adding it to any terrain or situation modifiers to come up with your modified firepower. In this instance, we have a 5. Normally, anything below this is the elimination range, but first we need to establish how much armor coverage is in play. The armor coverage is determined by which hex the shot intersects through to hit the target. If it enters through the front, then use the front armor. If it enters through one of the sides, you use side armor, and the rear is the rear armor. In this example, we're going to say the shot came through the side armor. So we're going to count back three from the modified firepower number, and that is the armor coverage. 
Now the numbers remaining in the elimination range, in this case 1 and 2, are the numbers you need to roll to destroy the vehicle. Now let's look at vehicles and guns versus other guns. First you're going to determine your modified firepower. This is the number after the slash. In this case it would be a 7. A close assault represents infantry attacking a vehicle using mines, grenades, bundles, etc. To conduct a close assault, your attacking unit must move into the same hex as the target, they must survive all enemy fire, and they must pass all morale checks. If all of this is successful, then you take the proficient firepower number, which is the number after the slash, and if you roll a dice and it's equal to or less than this, then the vehicle is destroyed. If the vehicle's armored and not open top, then there's a melee modifier of negative one. For whatever reason, if the attack is successful or it fails, the attacking unit returns to the hex it came from and is marked as used. The second way infantry squads can strike back is with special anti-tank weapons, or SATW. These are carried by infantry, and you can see it in the upper left-hand corner of the unit marker. Each nationality has its own version, and each has a different range and firepower. These weapons never work on infantry, and always work on tanks and vehicles. On weapon crews and guns, they have various effects, which we'll go through. Russians have an anti-tank rifle, which has a range of 10 hexes, but unfortunately a firepower of 4, and it only works on tanks and vehicles. The Americans have the iconic bazooka, with a range of 4 hexes, but a firepower ranging, depending on the year, from 9 to 11. This weapon also gives a plus 1 to attacker firepower for weapon crews and gun crews. The Germans have the Panzerschreck, and the Panzerfaust. The Panzerschreck has a range of 4 and a firepower of 18. It also gives a plus 1 to attacker firepower for weapons crews and gun crews. The Panzerfaust has a range of 2 to 3 and various firepower depending on the year deployed of 21 to 22. It's absolutely devastating. Finally, in a future expansion, the Commonwealth will arrive and they'll be able to use a projector infantry anti-tank weapon. This has a range of 3 and a firepower of 10, with a plus 1 to attacker firepower against weapons teams and gun teams. First, you must conduct an SATW check. This is a combination of a morale check and a proficiency check, and how it works is you take your current morale and you minus the number next to your SATW. So in this instance, if the morale is 10, you subtract 2, and you need to get an 8 or less to pass the check. Now this is the simple calculation. If you have other factors involved, there are additional modifiers, such as a negative 2 if you're op firing, plus 1 if it's marked as op fire, so that's good, negative 1 for assault fire, negative one for smoke, negative one for each hex of range, but five hexes if it's an anti-tank rifle, negative one per two hexes of intervening orchard, and negative two firing from a building or pillbox. So after all this, if you pass the check, you move on to step two. If you fail the check, you mark your unit as used and the turn for this unit is over. Once you've passed the SATW check, it's time to see if your shot destroyed the target. To do this, you will take the firepower of the SATW and subtract the armor of the vehicle you're attacking. In this instance, we're using a late year Panzerfaust with a firepower of 22 minus a T-70 side armor, which is a 3. This means you would need a 19 to hit. With this overwhelming firepower, you would assume you'd automatically destroy the tank, but there's always a 1 in 10 chance that you will miss. So in this instance, a roll of 9 or less will hit and destroy the tank,
but if you roll a 10, you miss. And that wraps up this edition of Harsh Rules. I thank you for watching, and I'll see you on the next episode.